every little boy looks forward to the day when he graduates from his Daisy Lever Action BB gun to his very own 410, a 20-gauge wingmaster. Then he can join his daddy and his friends in the dove field and blow them old dove out of the sky. I was no exception. My daddy had a buddy, Mr. Pud Derryberry, who owned some dove fields, which butted up to some property owned by the Quapaw Indian Nation out there near Lake Talawato. And I'd go out there with my daddy when I was 8 to 10 years old, and he'd let me take my BB gun where I'd look somewhat official. And then he'd set me down in a gully somewhere out of eye-blinding range of anybody, and he'd say, now you can shoot your BB gun, but you can't be pointing it anywhere in the direction of anybody, and never, ever shoot a low bird or a bird who has lit on the ground, because that ain't right. It just ain't sportsmanlike. Then he'd point to where he'd be stationed during the hunt, which for the sake of hunter safety and perhaps the safety of his own self would be about a quarter mile away in some plush black oil sunflower field, a millet field, a corn field, a soybean field. And as you know, all that old stuff is the very cuisine them old dove crave. Of course, there I was, far off from the action, hunkered down in the middle of a grassless patch of red dirt in a gully. Well, my dad, he'd walk into one of these old sunfly fields, and then directly a carload of them dove would come flying by in a drove, and them old boys in the field start firing them guns. Pow, 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 pow. It must have been about 30 of you gunners out there. And it sounded kind of like one of them big World War II Navy battles in the Pacific, like Midway or the Kula Gulf or the Battle of Tassafaranga. That's why I really didn't mind it so bad at first, being so far away from the action, because at least I could shut my eyes and pretend I was at Guadalcanal. Nevertheless, although my daddy knew there wasn't a snow cone's chance on a school bus that I'd hit me a bird with a BB, he figured that through my keen observation of the other shooters, I'd learn what all this dove hunting and all your 12 commandments of gun safety was all about. Well, all this worked out for the first season or so, but after a while, I became weird just sitting in a gully with horse flies and the sweat bees and fire ants a pestering me and carrying on, and I became anxious to carry a weapon that had some real lethal capability. Then one day, by accident, I come upon that very instrument of death. I was thumbing through a catalog in Mr. Pud's outhouse one hot day, and I spied a Fred Bear Instant Archery Child's bow and arrow set. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It was a 59-inch yellow fiberglass long bowl with a black rubber grip that come with 12 sharp-pointed target arrows. Well, I ordered that thing, and it come in the mail, and I begun to practice and practice in my backyard until I could hit a big paper target nailed on a tree from about 10 feet. The bowl had about a 20-pound pull on it, which sometimes made it difficult to hold the aim for a slightly built 10-year-old like myself, and I have to admit there were several occasions when an arrow got away from me before I was fully prepared for it, too. I really got blessed out by my next-door neighbor's daddy one time when I almost hit her training bicycle while she was a-riding on it. But anyhow, the big day come when I was going to take out my bow and arrow on them doves. My dad come home from work one coolish fall afternoon, and he's all upset and flustered about having to work that morning in the first place, and he was in a hurry, and he come crashing through the house like a blinded circus rhino, gathering up his shells and his vest and his dove bucket and his old Remington Model 11, and so on the way through, he said, Get in the car if you want to go now. So since I was already dressed in my little winter windbreaker, and my hunting cap with the earmuffs, and I'd been waiting on him for an hour anyway, I just collected my arrows and my bow, went and laid them down in the back seat floorboard. Then I come around and sat down in the front seat of our brand new 1965 Impala Chevrolet and awaited his arrival. Later, I realized that he had never once noticed that I was packing my bow and arrow. He's in such a hurry to get his own self out the door. 
Well, we drove out down Quapaw Highway, going about 85 miles an hour, and not a word was passed between the two of us, and we made record time getting to the dove field. Daddy just leapt out of that car and snatched up his hunting belongings, and he was fairly running to the millet field. He looked over his shoulder while he was running and said, If you want to, get over in that cornfield. Hud's let out his hogs. Ain't nobody over there. The cornfield was still a good ways from the field where folks was a-shooting. Well, I just carefully got together my archery equipment, and by this time I had a little leather coil for my arrows. Anyhow, I walked over to the cornfield and sat down behind some stalks. For the first time in my dove hunting career, I had cover to hide from my feathered prey. Every once in a while, some big old nasty hog would come grunting by, chomping on a roast near. Then after a while, the first bird flew overhead, and I let go with my arrow, which pierced nothing but air. Then another bird come by, then another, then another, and birds come a-flying, and I was a-shooting them arrows overhead, left to right, right to left, coming to me, going away, side action, and pretty soon I had shot all my arrows, and I hadn't hit the first bird. It was real frustrating, but there's only one thing to do. I had to go out and find all my arrows. It was getting kind of hot, so I took off my coat, laid down my bow, and started walking. Well, I walked and I walked through that cornfield, making wider and wider circles, and I couldn't find the first arrow. Finally, I figured they must have flown farther than I figured, so I carefully sashayed over to the millet field. The first person I come to was old Pud Dare Bear himself. He was about 75 years old then, and he was sitting on a stump underneath a persimmon tree, and he was wearing an old ragged hunting coat, and he was holding an old side-by-side shotgun in his lap, and he was white as a cake of soap. Also, he was shaking like a leaf. Up on the ground, in front of him, in between his shaking boots, stuck deep into the earth, was one of my lost arrows. I said, uh, Hey, Mr. Pud, how you doing? And he looked up at me slowly and said, I knowed it was a matter of time. We've been hunting these fields for over 20 years next to the reservation, making all this noise and commotion, and I knew the day would come when the Quapaw people was going to get tired of all this old shooting. And I said, hold on here, what do you mean? He says, the Quapaw Nation has declared war. About that time, Sparky Scroggins come up and he was holding three arrows in his hand. Hood, that's some idiot out here shooting arrows at us. I'm going to the store to call the police. And about this time, I was feeling real sick. Hold on now, Sparky, says Pud. We don't want the law involved in this. They'll call out the guard, and pretty soon we'll have us an Indian war, and real estate won't sell for nothing around here. Pud said, you go to your car, Sparky, lay down on that horn, and let's get all these men called up and figure out what to do. Well, I kind of backed on out of there and then got turned around and I went to walking and then walking a little faster and then a little faster until I was in kind of a stiff-legged trot till I could get back to my bow where I could bear the evidence. Anyhow, when I got back to the cornfield, the hogs was eating my jacket. I had to race them around now for about 30 minutes before I got a hold of what was left of my new windbreaker. Then I went over to my bow and kicked a lot of dirt clods all over it. At any rate, when I finally got back to the men, I caused a minor panic because my jacket was all eat up and they naturally thought I had been captured and abused by the Indians. Some news people was already over there and they was taking pictures. And I couldn't talk no sense to them because they's all so tore up. And after a while, though, they got simmered down a little bit and they was all gathered around Sparky's Pontiac and they had decided to send a peace delegation to the Quapaw chief. One of the men went behind the truck and pulled off his underwear and tied it around the barrel of his Browning Auto 5, and four of them went a-walking down the dirt road to the reservation. My dad said he thought it was best that we go back to town and get back to Mama and go to the grocery store and get some beanie weenies and some canned peaches and other non-perishable goods, toilet paper and such, just in case there was a siege. 
I guess the right thing for me to do would have been to come forward and to confess to everybody right there and then the foolish mistake that I had made. But as I reflected upon my mistake, it began to come to me just how foolish and obtuse and really inexcusable shooting pointy arrows in a dove field had been. I was real ashamed of myself. I also was afraid of getting a sheep dookie beat out of me. Some of them old boys are pretty big and hairy. Well, Daddy and me, run by Kroger's, went on home, locked the doors, put Mama in the basement, loaded the firearms, and waited for the worst. Next day, the little boy who delivers the paper on his bicycle slung a news into our driveway. Peace had been preserved. There in the paper was a picture of me in my eat-up hog jacket with a caption, Hostage Rescued. Then the story went on to say that our peace delegation had informed what I am sure was a surprised Quapaw Nation that the white community did not desire hard feelings and bloodshed with them, and they was prepared to cede to the reservation through a brand new treaty, the soybean field adjacent to the tribe, the Little League field down the river, and the J.C. Penney store downtown. The Quapaws asked that the IGA food liner be thrown in as well, and the delegation readily agreed. Well, I guess I ought to feel bad for causing all this trouble, but in a way, I felt I had struck a blow for social justice because there can be no uncertainty that the Quapaws and other original inhabitants of the Lake Talawato area had been gypped out of land and property by the early trappers, preachers, and convicts that first settled this county. It was only right that they be given back a little bit of what had been ruthlessly and dishonestly stole from them in the first place. And besides that, I didn't trade at IGA anyway. At the moment I read the newspaper article, I didn't feel bad. I felt kind of, well, extraordinarily fortunate. Because as I read and reread the caption under my photograph, Hostage Rescued, I knew in my heart of hearts it could just as easily have read Cornfield Sniper apprehended.